Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another deep dive. Yeah, always great to be here. So um, this time around, you've given us a really interesting uh, set of articles and research all about autism. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you're especially interested in the experience of autistic adults. Yeah. Um, and specifically this thing called emotional blunting. Yeah, emotional blunting. We'll definitely get to that. But I noticed there's also quite a bit in here about sensory sensitivities and burnout. Right. The challenges of social situations, relationships, uh, even some stuff on religious trauma. Oh, wow. Yeah. All really fascinating stuff. And we're going to try to touch on all of it. But I think uh, emotional blunting seems like a good place to start. Yeah, I agree. So let's unpack that. Yeah. What is it? Why might it be more common in autistic adults? And what can you do about it yeah. if this is something that resonates with your own experience? Okay, sounds good. Let's dive in. It's definitely a complex topic with a lot of nuances. So help me understand this. What exactly is emotional blunting? Well, it's sometimes called alexithymia, and it basically means having difficulty identifying and describing your own emotions. Okay. And it's important to note that it's not about not having feelings. Right. It's more about struggling to pinpoint exactly what you're feeling and putting it into words. Okay, so not emotionless, but more of a disconnect between the feeling and actually being able to articulate it. Yeah, exactly. You know, one of the sources that you sent used the phrase muted emotions. Uh -huh. I thought that was kind of an interesting way to put it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good way to think about it. Imagine being told you're too calm or too analytical in situations where others might be, you know, visibly upset or excited. Right. It's almost like your emotional response is turned down a notch. Yeah, I can see how that would be really confusing for people, mm -hmm. especially if inside you are experiencing those emotions, mm -hmm. you're just not expressing them outwardly in the same way that other people might. Exactly. And that's where a lot of the misunderstandings can come in because yeah. people might misinterpret your lack of outward expression as a lack of feeling. Right. Or caring. Exactly. Yeah. One of the research articles you provided described it as feeling like an outside observer of your own emotions. Yes. So instead of experiencing, say, joy directly, you might be thinking, okay, I recognize that this is a situation that typically makes people happy. Mm hmm but I'm not feeling that happiness myself. Right. It's like you're watching yourself go through the motions, yeah. but not fully connecting with the emotions themselves. That must make it really hard to connect with other people on an emotional level. It can be a real challenge. You know, it makes me think about that article you included on autism and romantic relationships. Yeah. Where some of the people they interviewed talked about feeling like they were just going through the motions of a relationship mm -hmm. without genuinely experiencing those emotional highs and lows that their partner was going through. That's a perfect example of how emotional blunting can impact relationships. And it's not just romantic relationships. It can affect friendships, family dynamics, even interactions at work. Right. So we're starting to see how this can have real world consequences. Yeah, definitely. But before we go any further down that road, I kind of want to back up a bit. All right. How does all of this connect specifically to autism? Well, research suggests that emotional blunting is more prevalent among autistic individuals. Right. There are a few possible explanations for this. Okay. And they all point to the unique ways that the autistic brain is wired and the particular challenges that autistic people face. Okay. So this is where it gets really interesting for me. The why behind this connection. Right. So what's going on in the brain that might lead to this experience? Well, studies have shown variations in certain brain areas that are responsible for processing and regulating emotions mm -hmm. in autistic individuals. Okay. One of the research papers you shared highlighted the amygdala. Okay. Which plays a key role in emotional responses and how it might function differently in autistic people. So there are literal physical differences yeah. in brain structure and activity that might be contributing to this. Exactly. And these differences could contribute to the difficulty recognizing and labeling emotions that we see in emotional blunting. Fascinating. Yeah. So it's not just about, you know, the brain structure itself. Right. It's also about lived experiences. Absolutely. You can't separate nature from nurture. Right. The social and communication challenges that many autistic people face also play a role. Right. So think about it. If you're constantly misinterpreting or being misunderstood in social situations, yeah. it can be really tough to develop a clear understanding of your own emotional landscape. That makes total sense. Mm -hmm. If the social world feels really confusing and unpredictable, maybe shutting down emotionally becomes a way to cope. Exactly. In fact, one of the personal accounts that you included 
described exactly that mm. feeling emotionally overwhelmed in social situations and kind of learning to suppress their emotions as a defense mechanism. Yes, yeah. that's a common experience. Some autistic individuals develop coping mechanisms like suppressing emotions to manage sensory or emotional overload. It's like turning down the volume on your feelings to make the world a little less overwhelming. But then that can lead to emotional blunting. Exactly. It can become a vicious cycle. Right. You're trying to protect yourself, but it ends up creating these new challenges. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of challenges, we've touched on relationships, but what other areas of life can be affected by this? Well, I think that's a great place to pick up in part two of this deep dive. Awesome. Sounds good to me. Yeah, we can delve into how emotional blunting can impact things like work, school, and even your overall sense of self. I'm really interested to hear more about that. We'll be right back after a quick break. So before the break, we were talking about how emotional blunting can really make it difficult to connect with other people on an emotional level. Yeah, and you know, going through all of this research, it seems like that theme of connection just kept coming up over and over again. Yeah, it's a big one. Especially when it comes to relationships. There's so much in here about family dynamics, friendships, romantic relationships, even those online communities that you included. Mm -hmm. It seems like understanding these relationships is really key for you. It is. And it makes sense when you consider the unique challenges that emotional blunting can create in those areas. Right. Like, for example, one of the studies you sent actually argues that for some autistic people, mm -hmm. struggling with emotional literacy can actually lead to social isolation and difficulty forming strong bonds with others. That makes me think about that young woman's blog post that you yeah. included. <laughs> oh, yeah. She talked about feeling like an alien observing human interaction from a distance. Right. Like she desperately wanted to connect, mm -hmm. but she just couldn't figure out how to do it authentically. And that's the heartbreaking part about it. You know, yeah. it's like you see these connections happening around you. Right. But you don't quite know how to bridge that gap yourself. Right. So let's say you're in a close relationship with someone. Okay. And your partner's upset about something. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling to even identify your own feelings. Right. How can you possibly respond in a way that's authentic and supportive? It's tough. It's really tough. And that's where things can get tricky. Yeah. It's like that research paper we were discussing earlier. Yeah. About emotional mirroring and relationships. That's right. If you can't recognize your own emotions, it's going to be that much harder to empathize with what your partner is going through. Exactly. And that lack of emotional mirroring can create a real disconnect in the relationship. Yeah. Your partner might feel like, you're not really there for them emotionally. Right. Even if you care deeply. Which is so frustrating. It is. Because you do care. Yeah. It's just that expressing it in a way that other people understand can be so challenging. It's almost like you're speaking different emotional languages. Right. And those subtle cues that we all rely on. Right. To understand each other. Like tone of voice. Exactly. Facial expressions. All of that. Body language. It can be really difficult to pick up on for someone who's experiencing emotional blunting. So it's easy to see how that could lead to misunderstandings and hurt feelings, mm -hmm. even when there's no ill intention. Right. I'm thinking about those online forums that you shared. Yeah. Where people were talking about accidentally offending their friends. Right. Or coming across as cold and uncaring, even when that's not at all how they felt. It happens all the time, and it can be really damaging to relationships. And then there's that added layer of complexity when it comes to romantic relationships. Right. Because so much of building intimacy relies on that vulnerability. Yeah, exactly. Being able to share your feelings openly and honestly with your partner. It's essential for a healthy relationship. Right. Yeah. And that can be incredibly difficult if you're struggling with emotional blunting. Yeah, it can feel like a huge barrier. This makes me think of that other research paper that talked about the importance of clear communication in autistic relationships. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Really highlighted how crucial it is for both partners to understand and accept those differences in emotional expression. Yeah, it's not about trying to change each other. Right. It's about learning how to communicate effectively despite those differences. So it's about recognizing that those differences don't have to be deal breakers. Exactly. They just require a little more effort and understanding to navigate. Right. You know, you included quite a bit of research on family relationships as well. Yes. Which I think is particularly relevant here. Absolutely. Because family dynamics can be incredibly complex for anyone. Yeah. For sure. But for autistic individuals who already feel different or misunderstood, mm -hmm. those complexities can feel even more magnified. Especially if there's a lack of understanding or acceptance of autism within the family. Right. I'm thinking about that one article that talked about the double empathy problem. Oh, yeah. 
The idea that communication breakdowns often happen because both autistic and non-autistic people struggle to understand each other's perspectives. That's a really important concept to keep in mind. And then when you layer emotional blunting on top of that, right. it's easy to see how those communication breakdowns could become even more frequent and frustrating. For sure. And it can lead to a lot of hurt feelings on both sides. There were some really powerful anecdotes in that family support group forum that you shared. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents were expressing concern about their autistic children struggling to express affection. Yeah. Or feeling disconnected from family events. It's common worry. It just highlights the need for open communication within families. Absolutely. Especially when an autistic family member is dealing with emotional blunting. It's crucial to create a space where everyone feels safe to express themselves. Right. Even if those expressions are different from what's considered typical. So it's about recognizing and validating those differences. Exactly. Rather than trying to force everyone into the same emotional mold. Right. We need to celebrate neurodiversity, not mm -hmm. try to erase it. And this brings us to a recurring theme in your research that I found really empowering. Oh, yeah. The concept of self-advocacy. Yes. Self-advocacy is so important. There was so much about the importance of autistic individuals learning to advocate for their own needs and experiences. Right. And I can see how that would be especially crucial when it comes to emotional blunting. It is. Because it's not always easy for others to understand what you're going through if you can't fully articulate it yourself. Right. So learning to advocate for your needs becomes essential. It can be as simple as saying, you know, I might not always show my emotions in the same way that you do, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean I don't feel them. That's a great example. Just setting those clear expectations and inviting understanding. Right. And it can help to reframe those potentially hurtful interactions. In what way? Instead of seeing it as, oh, I upset my friend because I didn't react the right way. It mm -hmm. becomes my friend was hurt because they didn't understand my experience. Right. But now I have the tools to help them understand. That's a huge shift in perspective. Yes. It, it takes away that self-blame. Yeah. And empowers you to kind of take control of the situation. Exactly. And that's what self-advocacy is all about. And I think that ties back to what we were discussing earlier. Okay. But the need for society to become more accepting and understanding of different ways of experiencing and expressing emotions. Absolutely. It's a two-way street. Autistic individuals can learn to advocate for themselves. Right. But it's also up to society to create a more inclusive and welcoming environment where those differences are celebrated rather than stigmatized. So it's not just about individuals adapting. Right. It's about systemic change as well. Exactly. And that change starts with awareness and understanding. The fact that you're taking the time to delve into this topic is incredibly encouraging. Well, I'm glad. And, you know, there's still so much to unpack from the research you shared. We've only briefly touched on sensory sensitivities and burnout. Right. So should we dive into those next? Let's do it. Okay, so let's shift gears a bit and explore these ideas of sensory sensitivities and burnout. You've included a ton of material on these topics, from personal blog posts to scientific studies. It's clearly an area you're deeply interested in. Yeah, absolutely. And for good reason. Okay. Sensory sensitivities and burnout are incredibly common among autistic adults. Okay. And they often go hand in hand. So for a listener who might not be familiar with these concepts, let's break them down. What exactly are sensory sensitivities? Okay. So imagine how you react to certain sounds, smells, textures, or even visual input. Okay. Now amplify those reactions okay. to the point where they can be distracting, overwhelming, or even physically painful. Oh. That's what many autistic people experience with the sensory sensitivities. Like the volumes turned up way too high on certain senses. Yeah. Or in some cases, maybe even turned way down. Yeah. You're exactly right. There's actually two sides to this coin. Some autistic individuals are hypersensitive, meaning they're easily overwhelmed by things that others might not even notice. Hmm. Think about the hum of a fluorescent light or the feel of a certain fabric. Okay. Those can be incredibly intense experiences for someone with hypersensitivity. That reminds me of that blog post you sent where the writer described grocery shopping as an absolute nightmare. Oh, yeah. Because of the overwhelming combination of fluorescent lights, crowds, and unexpected noises. Yeah, it's a sensory overload nightmare for many people. Right. And it's a great example of how something most people take for granted can be a real struggle for someone with sensory sensitivities. Yeah, and then on the flip side, some people are hyposensitive. Right. They crave those more intense sensory experiences. Exactly. And might seek out things like loud noises, 
bright lights, strong smells. Right. They might need that extra input to feel regulated. So it's almost like their sensory thermostat is set differently. I like that analogy. Right. What feels just right to one person can be completely overwhelming or e even underwhelming to another. Exactly. And the key takeaway here is that these sensitivities can impact every aspect of life. Trying to focus at work when the sound of a nearby conversation is sending shivers down your spine or struggling to enjoy a social gathering because the lighting is too harsh. Right. These are common experiences for people with sensory sensitivities. Yeah, it really paints a picture of how exhausting it can be mm. to constantly navigate a world that doesn't seem to fit your sensory needs. It's a constant battle for many people. And speaking of exhaustion, this brings us to the topic of burnout. Okay. Which seems to be closely linked to sensory overload. Yeah, it definitely is a contributing factor. In fact, you included a study that found a really strong correlation mm -hmm. between the severity of sensor sensitivities and the likelihood of experiencing burnout. It's a big one. But you know, burnout is more than just feeling tired. Absolutely. It's a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion caused by prolonged exposure to overwhelming stressors. And for autistic individuals, those stressors can include not just sensory overload, but also the constant effort of navigating a world that's not designed for their neurology. Right. So it's like you're carrying this extra weight all the time. Yeah. Just to try to fit in. Exactly. Imagine having to mask your autistic traits all day long just to avoid negative reactions from others or constantly trying to decipher social cues and expectations that feel confusing and illogical. You're essentially running a marathon every day just to keep up with the demands of normal life. Wow, that's such a powerful image. It is. It's exhausting. And it makes me think of those forum posts that you shared where people described feeling like they were constantly on stage, mm -hmm. performing a role that didn't feel authentic to who they were. Yeah, that's a common experience. Right, and then over time, that constant effort takes a toll. It does. It really does. Increased anxiety, depression, irritability, difficulty concentrating, even physical symptoms like headaches or insomnia. These are all signs of burnout. So what can you do if you're listening to this and you're thinking, wow, this is me. I'm experiencing burnout. What are some practical steps? Well, the first step is recognizing that burnout is a real thing and it's not a sign of weakness. Okay. It's a sign that you've been pushing yourself too hard for too long. Okay, so what does self-care look like in this context? Okay, well, there are a few key things to focus on. Identifying your sensory triggers and finding ways to minimize exposure to them is crucial. That might mean wearing noise-canceling headphones in loud environments, seeking out quiet spaces when you need a break, or even something as simple as choosing clothes that feel comfortable on your skin. It's about creating a sensory environment that feels safe and supportive. So it's not about, you know, becoming a hermit and avoiding the world entirely. Right. It's about making those conscious choices to create a more manageable sensory experience. Yeah, exactly. And don't forget about managing stress and anxiety in general. Exercise, meditation, spending time in nature, or engaging in activities you genuinely enjoy. Right. These can all help to replenish your energy and build resilience. So it's about finding those things that bring you joy and make you feel more like yourself. Exactly. And... You know, that brings to mind that book that you included on autistic joy. Oh, yeah. That argued we need to focus more on what brings autistic people happiness and fulfillment. Absolutely. Rather than just focusing on the challenges. Right. Celebrating those moments of joy and finding ways to cultivate more of them is essential, especially when you're battling burnout. And remember, self-care also means setting boundaries and saying no to things that drain your energy. It's okay to decline social invitations if you're feeling overwhelmed. It's okay to ask for accommodations at work or school. It's about prioritizing your own needs and well-being, which can be tough, but so important. It's like giving yourself permission to put on your own oxygen mask first. Exactly. Right. You can't help others if you're not taking care of yourself. That's a perfect way to put it. And finally, never hesitate to seek professional support. A therapist can help you develop coping strategies, connect you with resources, and provide a safe space to process your experiences. This has been such a rich and informative deep dive. As we wrap up, is there one final thought you'd like to leave our listener with? All the challenges we've discussed, emotional blunting, sensory sensitivities, burnout, they're all part of the autistic experience, but they don't define you. Yeah. You are a complex individual with unique strengths, talents, and perspectives, and the world needs those strengths, talents, and perspectives. Never stop exploring, never stop learning, and never stop sharing your authentic self with the world. That's beautiful. And on that note, we're going to wrap up this deep dive. We hope this exploration has provided some valuable insights and sparked further curiosity for you. 
Remember, knowledge is power, and the more we understand about ourselves and each other, the more connected and compassionate our world can become. Keep diving deep.